So I'd like to talk about some of the things my students and postdocs at UCSF and I have been working on for the last few years. And I'm going to actually try to give two talks. I, I succeeded in doing this in uh, Telluride last summer at this workshop on neuromorphic engineering that we've been running for 25 years, actually. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. But if it gets too late, I'll just uh, let one of, let this, and not give the second part of the talk. So we know that neural plasticity really depends on configurations of the circuits that excite neurons and that result in, in responses of excitatory neurons. And, and this is the anatomy of, that sustains this is something we, we looked at a long time ago in early life where we could see this reconfiguration of the circuits. Um, but more recently, we've been studying adult plasticity, which is a different thing. And the interesting thing about uh, both plasticity and development, activity-dependent plasticity and development, and both of these forms of adult plasticity that we've seen is that, you know, despite the fact that the plasticity is actually affected by changes in the excitatory circuits, all these forms of plasticity are actually triggered and caused to happen by the actions of specific types of inhibitory neurons. And, and, in, and in fact, in the two stories I'll tell today, they are different types of inhibitory neurons. Inhibitory neurons are different from the excitatory neurons because instead of being born and going straight up into the cortex, they're born in a completely different place from where the excitatory neurons are called the ganglionic eminences. And they have to migrate by a very long indirect route to get to the cortex where they uh, differentiate. And um, the, the different kinds of inhibitory neurons are born in different places. And so the, the first story I'll tell is a, involves an inhibitory neuron called VIP neurons, which is not very important person neuron. It's vasoactive intestinal peptide. These neurons, in addition to secreting the inhibitory neurotransmitter, uh, secrete uh, GABA. They secrete a peptide called VIP. Um, and they come from one place uh, in early development. And then the, the second story uh, involves uh, a much more common kind of interneuron, which comes from a, a different place embryonically. But the, the plasticity assay we uh, use in a lot of these experiments is derived from uh, really work uh, slightly more than 50 years ago by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who showed that there is a a rapid form of activity-dependent plasticity that takes place only during a critical period in early life. If one eye is allowed to see normally and the vision of the other eye is blurred or occluded, then what happens within, within a week is a rearrangement of the connections to the cortex that serve the deprived eye and a loss of response to the deprived eye in the cortex that is lifelong. So just this brief period of unequal vision during early life can have lifelong consequences. And until the last 15 years or so, one or two percent, one to two percent of American children would suffer this loss of, uh, a loss of uh, decent vision in an eye that was, if they were born with the eye pointing at the nose or with a droopy eyelid or with congenital cataract, uh, they suffered from this problem clinically. Although, unless they lost their good eye, it didn't compromise their life very much. And this, this rapid plasticity during this critical period in early development is associated with a a pruning of the axons that go from the lateral geniculate nucleus to convey visual input to the primary visual cortex. And what we saw is that the axons normally make lots of connections in a big bush like this. And after 
uh, a week of, of uh, visual deprivation during the critical period, whereas deprivation earlier or later than the critical period has no such effect, these bushes get pruned and lose about half of their branches and half of their synaptic connections. And the effects on visual responses past the input layer of the cortex, these, this direct input goes to a particular layer of the cortex, layer four. But if you look above there in the uh, upper layers of the cortex, which is the first stage of purely cortical processing, the plasticity is much more rapid. So within one to two days, most neurons lose their ability to respond to the eye that was closed and only respond to the eye that was open. And it turns out that there is a sort of millimeter scale anatomical rearrangement of connections um, that, correspond, that also takes place not in the input layer, but in the layer of cortex above there that, cor that happens about as rapidly as this physiological change. So we studied all of these things in cats and in ferrets and a little bit in monkeys earlier. But to understand the mechanisms of what's going on with this activity-dependent plasticity, with the only tools that we had available, which was essentially pharmacology and lesions and uh, behavioral tools, um, we made very little progress. We, we just couldn't, couldn't figure out what was going on. We had these very interesting phenomena that were even clinically important, but um, but it was pretty hopeless. And so, um, largely in part stimulated by a wonderful graduate student, Josh Gordon, who is now the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, but when he was in the lab, he said, come on, let's really work on genetically altered mice. We have molecular genetics. We can probe mechanism by, uh, in, a, in a straightforward way if we use mice. And, uh, and so we started using mice, and mice do have two eyes. They can see you with both of their eyes, so they have a binocular part of, the vi part of their visual system. And in fact, when you look at the anatomy, you can see that there's a part of the visual cortex that gets input from both eyes via the lateral geniculate nucleus, as well as a part you know, that's over on the side, which can only be seen through one eye. And when Chris Neal was in the lab, uh, a postdoctoral fellow, what we found is when we looked carefully at the receptive fields of neurons in the mouse visual cortex, that in the upper layers, there were many neurons that looked like they could have come from the classic 1962 paper that Hubel and Weasel wrote about the cat, the, really the earliest discovery of how the cat visual system worked. Uh, which turn, is also true of the monkey and, and of people, which there are these clear elongated cells with elongated receptive fields which respond to oriented contours in, in the world. These are simple cells. There are also other kinds of cells called complex cells. And essentially all of the excitatory neurons in the upper layers were more or less like this, and the only neurons that were not selective for the edges, for the orientation of edges of contours, are shown in blue here. Those were the, the inhibitory neurons. So we, you know, knowing that the mouse visual system had a lot of similarities to the mammalian, to the higher mammals that we're interested in, um, we looked, uh, and this was Josh's work, at activity-dependent plasticity. And what we found was even though the mouse has overwhelmingly input from the contralateral eye and much less input from the ipsilateral eye, in the binocular zone, if you closed one eye for as little as four days, you would cause a change in the balance of input from favoring the contralateral eye to favoring more the ipsilateral eye. This phenomenon had a clear critical period you did the same four-day deprivation earlier or later, nothing happened. Uh, but during this sensitive week, there was a big change. And we spent a lot of time dissecting the, uh, the chemical signaling mechanisms that cells exchanged 
to make this deprivation happen and to allow it to recover. So actually, if you open the deprived eye during the critical period, things go back to their initial state. And that depends on one signaling system and so on. And the, the nice thing in the last few years is we've enact, actually been able to watch this happen uh, while it's happening in two photon microscopy. We can see the inputs disappear and some new inputs reappear uh, over the course of a few days uh, watching if we put in a molecular marker that shows one of the, the proteins that's important in the postsynaptic density or in the presynaptic terminals, we can actually see this plasticity. But like all things in neuroscience, devising a measurement technique ended up being crucial for understanding what was going on in biology. I mean, the big advance while I was a graduate student was my PhD advisor and I created the first computer-driven optical display where you could randomly interleave visual stimuli, record the responses, and get quantitative measures of plasticity, which everything else had been done by hand, just estimating what was going on by listening to the sounds of the neurons as you stimulated by hand. And our advance was to uh, automate this and instrument this so we could get quantitative measures. So the, this next technique that we invented uh, allowed us to get high resolution maps and measure responses reproducibly in a non-invasive way in the mouse visual cortex using uh, repeated presentation of a stimulus and analyzing the spectrum of responses. So it turns out that when uh, blood in the capillary bed in the brain loses oxygen because the neurons in that area are more, more active, the optical absorption of the hemoglobin molecule changes. And if you illuminate with the right wavelength of light, and one of the wavelengths that works is 610 nanometers, what you see is the cortex gets darker. So this is the response to a horizontal bar moving up in the brain. Uh, moving up in the visual field, and you can see this wave of darkness spreads through in the uh, several of the early visual areas. And so this technique allows us to make quantitative measurements of overall responses in the visual cortex that are, you know, my the uh, postdoctoral fellow who was working on us that we measured 47 mice in a row. And the, the signals vary in intensity by less than 5%. And so they're highly stable in an animal if you don't cause plasticity. It's the only thing that goes into the brain through an intact skull is light, just a little bit of red light that's much too, uh, much too little intensity to give rise to photodynamic damage. And having this technique, uh, if we restrict the visual stimulus to the binocular zone, we could measure the response through one eye and measure the response separately through the other eye and calculate the balance of inputs to the two eyes. So technical advances, and I, I think this is important in a biomedical engineering program, being able to make good quantitative measurements of something instead of um, uh, non-quantitative measurements is, is really important to be able to do good biology. So we were very interested in this plasticity that takes place during early development. But all the work until that time had been done in anesthetized animals. And we know there's no plasticity under anesthesia. Anesthesia completely prevents the plasticity. So we were really interested in studying alert animals. And fortunately, uh, an apparatus was being built. Uh, the first instance of it was in David Tank's lab at Princeton that allowed us to study the visual cortex of alert mice. And it was a scaled up version of something had been, that had been done at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen with flies. So they had a, flies walking on a ping pong ball. They used that to study optimotor responses in the fly. And the scaled up version 
is, is this. Uh, uh, this is a mouse with its head fixed walking on a styrofoam ball that's floating on air. So if the mouse pushes on the ball, instead of moving his head, which is fixed to a stainless steel plate, uh, the, it, the ball just goes down. And the mouse is actually, he loves this. He's very happy. He'll walk or run sometimes. He'll stand there sometimes. If you give him some angel hair pasta or a sunflower seed, he'll gobble it up. And, uh, and yet his head is fixed, so this allows us to use silicon microprobes to record neurons in his brain, or to use two-photon microscopy to record signals, optical signals from the brain. And this let us study the alert mouse. And much to our um, satisfaction, the properties of the neurons that we had previously measured in anesthetized mice were pretty much the same in alert mice. But one thing was really different. And uh, at first, we, did, we didn't realize what was going on. And we just said, boy, responses are a lot more variable in the alert mice. But that turned out not to be the case. What was the case was that when the animal was walking or running, the responses were just a lot bigger. And so we referred to the state in which the brain was put during locomotion as the high gain state. Because if you plot response as a function of stimulus orientation, uh, the red line shows what you would see in an anesthetized animal, which is pretty much what you see when an animal is quiet and alert, you know, like he stops running for a minute, for a few seconds. And you, measure, you can measure this response. And then as soon as the animal starts to walk or run, the response becomes much larger. But the tuning is exactly the same. So it's exactly as if you turned up the gain on an amplifier. So there's no change in the spontaneous activity. The evoked activity is much bigger. But the, the width of tuning, the orientation selectivity, and the width of tuning doesn't change. So this was a high gain state of the mouse visual cortex. And it was a state of cortex. It wasn't that anything coming from, in, from the eyes was changed although we worry about this, because when we made simultaneous recordings from the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the pathway which is in between the eyes and the visual cortex, there was no such change, that the responses in the geniculate nucleus were quantitatively unchanged uh, during locomotion, whereas the responses from the cortex were, were much greater. So this, this was really interesting to us. And we're interested in, well, what are the pathways that convey this signal to the cortex that the animal is walking or running and makes the responses have much higher gain? And so to study this, we, we, we read a bunch of old papers about the midbrain locomotor center. So a Russian, Orlovsky, along with some Swedes, found that there was a place in the midbrain near the the pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus, where if you put an electrode and stimulate it electrically, even in a, they were studying cats, even in a cat where the cortex had been removed, uh, the, the legs would start to move and the animal would start to walk, or, or if you stimulated harder, would start to run. Now, it wasn't clear at that time that there were actually cells here that were doing that, because it could have been that you were just stimulating some axons that were passing by. But of course, nowadays, we can infect the cells with opsins. And so we can optogenetically activate these cells with light. And there are three different classes of cells there. And we separately optogenetically transfected them, activated them with light, and made the cells fire. Look at the blue light. As soon as the blue light comes on, the animal starts to run. Blue light goes off, he stops. Blue light comes on again, he starts to run and stuff. And so this shows that the midbrain locomotor center actually is a locomotor center. There are cells there that when you turn them on, it makes the animal start to walk or run. And not surprisingly, the cortex went into the high gain state. But Actually, this experiment was 
completely uninformative for our purposes because you don't have to optogenetically stimulate the midbrain locomotor center uh, to get the cortex to go into the, opti uh, you know, into the high gain state. It goes into the high gain state whenever the animal walks or runs by itself. What was informative, however, was that we could turn down the intensity or the frequency of this optogenetic stimulus to a point where the legs no longer moved. So the animal just stayed there quite alert. But the, the cortex still would go into the high gain state. So it wasn't these descending connections from this that make the legs move that were turning on the cortex. It was one or another of the ascending connections. And since there were a bunch of them, we next turned to the cortex itself to try to figure out what was going on. And in the mouse at that time, and, and now still, there were a bunch of uh, mouse lines that in which different classes of cells would express a recombinase, which allows you, if you have a, a, a class of cells that expresses a recombinase, you can express a, uh, a protein in those cells, which uh, only in the presence of the recombinase gets expressed. So, I mean, it, it's called, you express a floxed construct, which has lox P sites uh, surrounding a stop codon. And when that stop codon is cut out, whatever is after that gets expressed. Uh, and so, what we wanted to do, and what we did, was one by one took all the Cree lines that were available with Cree recombinase and expressed a red protein, uh, TD tomato, in these cells one at a time. And then we made images of the cortex with two photomicroscopy to record the calcium signals in these neurons. So when neurons are active and fire action potentials, Calcium enters those neurons, and there are fluorophores. Uh, the, the, the common one is uh, G-CAMP, it's called. It's, uh, you don't need to know the chemistry. Uh, but essentially, you, the, the cell twinkles bright uh, with this calcium fluorophore whenever it's active. And so we look to see, are there any cells in the visual cortex that become active in the dark when the animal starts to walk or run. Because, you know, in the light, when the animal's seeing things, all kinds of activity is there in the visual cortex. But in the dark, most of the cells aren't responding to anything. So our screen was to look for cells that were activated by locomotion in the dark. And it turns out that there was a minor population of inhibitory cells that express the peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, uh, that tracked locomotion in the dark. So here's a measure of the running speed of a mouse as a function of time over, f uh, you know, what, eight minutes, 450 seconds. And here's the calcium signal inside a VIP neuron. And all of the VIP neurons do this. That, so you can see that these two signals are almost the same. So that they, they actually track VIP, even in the dark, tracks locomotion and the VIP cells are sitting at the top layer uh, of the visual cortex. And 97% of the other cells in the visual cortex were like this. They didn't care about locomotion at all. So initially, this was very puzzling because the phenomenon we had to explain is why did the neurons in the visual cortex respond so much more strongly to visual stimuli during locomotion? And here, what we'd found was an inhibitory cell. And the mystery was solved, I think, when um, uh, my colleague, my present colleague, although he was at San Diego at that time, Massimo Sconziani and Rafa Eusti's lab in New York had a similar finding, that the output of the VIP cells is not to the excitatory pyramidal cells of the visual cortex. It's instead VIP cells their output goes to somatostatin cells, which is another kind of inhibitory neuron. And the somatostatin cells exert very powerful input on the visually responsive pyramidal cells. So when the mouse starts to walk or run, these cells are active. They inhibit these cells. These cells 
no longer inhibit the excitatory cells. And so the specific visual inputs that drive these cells and make them selective for particular visual stimuli, those specific inputs just produce more spikes. So if that idea were true, then at least um, some of the somatostatin cells and the, the somatostatin creline labels actually three different kinds of cells that have in common that they express somatostatin but are otherwise different from one another. And about a third of the somatostatin cells show this behavior, which is when the animals are running, they become silent. So that's consistent with this thing. So if we were right that the VIP cells were conveying this signal of locomotion to the cortex and putting the cortex in the high gain state, we ought to be able to take a mouse which is just sitting there in its cage and turn on the VIP cells and mimic the effect of locomotion. And we, mi we mimic it in these experiments, not quite completely, but pretty well. So here's the response as a function of orientation of a cell when the animal's just standing there uh, without locomotion. And this is the response when, he, when we optogenetically activate, activate an opsin in the VIP cells that makes the VIP cells fire a lot. And on average, the responses are greater when the animal, when we activate the VIP cells, even without locomotion. So we can uh, partially mimic the activity of locomotion by activating VIP cells. And more importantly, if the animal is actually walking or running, can we turn off the VIP cells and block the effect of locomotion? And this turned out to be a very frustrating, frustrating experiment because there were essentially five techniques people had for transiently turning off cells. And we tried them, you know, one after another, and none of them were successful in, in and recorded the activity of the VIP cells. And the VIP cells get very powerfully activated by locomotion uh, through a pathway that I won't talk about now. And none of the things that turn off cells were powerful enough to overcome this excitation. So finally, you know, uh, the postdoc who was working on this came in to my office and, you know, when the fifth one failed, we were feeling really bad. We wanted to finish this work and publish the paper. I said, let's just blow the blankers away. <laughs> so that's what we did. We took our microscopic field, our, we labeled our VIP cells with a red dye, a, a TD tomato, a floxed TD tomato that we expressed under the control of the VIP promoter. So we could tell which cells were VIP cells. We put a chemical in that let us record the calcium signals. And we measured, uh, we measured how much does locomotion increase the response of, the, of most of the cells, uh, not counting the VIP cells, which is, you know, the 97% of the other cells that are activated by visual stimuli. And, you know, it was almost doubled the responses uh, to locomotion. We knew that would happen anyway. Then we went in and one by one focused our laser on the VIP cells and blew them up. I mean, photodynamically damaged them, we said. <laughs> and, uh, and after they were damaged, we just repeated what we'd done before and measured the visual responses of all the other cells. Uh, during locomotion, while they were stationary and during locomotion. Locomotion had no effect anymore at uh, changing the activity of the cells. So the, you know, instead of almost doubling it, it really didn't change it at all. So with the VIP cells gone, this, um, you know, we really blocked the effect of locomotion. So this was, this was very exciting to us. I think it was, it was quite strong evidence, even though it wasn't reversible, um, you know, that if the VIP cells aren't there anymore, uh, locomotion doesn't work. So it really was strong evidence that the VIP cells were the pathway by which locomotion puts the cortex in this high gain state. 
So given that the cortex was um, more active, we wondered, this was in normal adult mice, um, is, there, is there more plasticity uh, if there's more activity? You would think with more spikes there'd be more plasticity maybe. And so we used a phenomenon that's relevant to the human condition of amblyopes who, who have uh, compromised vision through one eye during a critical period in early life. And so we deprived mice through their critical period for a couple of more months. And then we opened the deprived eye and measured the magnitude of the responses to the deprived eye over a period of recovery. And what happened is exactly what happens in human amblyopes with one of my colleagues in, um, in the ophthalmology and neurology departments. We've looked at adult human amblyopes who lose their good eye and measured their vision in their bad eye. And it recovers to some extent, but it never gets more than about halfway to the normal range. And that's what happened in the mice. So we asked, suppose we give these mice visual stimulation while they are during this period of recovery. If, the, if vision, the responses are enhanced during locomotion, do we enhance the recovery? And indeed, that was true. So if we allowed the animal to see a specific visual stimuli during recover, recovery, the response to that stimulus recovered almost to the normal range within a week. Whereas if we just let the animal have locomotion with a gray screen, or if we let it have the visual stimulation actually for twice as long, but in their home cage so they didn't have an opportunity to run around, that was just like not giving them any special um, treatment at all. It was just like leaving them in their home cage. They didn't recover very much. So we had kind of three stories. We, we showed running enhances responses. We showed that there's this circuit involving VIP cells in the cortex. And I haven't told you about the subcortical parts of that circuit much. That's activated by running to enhance responses. And we'd shown that running enhances plasticity and presumably through the enhanced responses. But, but, you know, it wasn't clear whether this enhanced plasticity directly or maybe it's just, you know, aerobic exercise, which, you know, you read Runner's World and actually the New York Times Science, Science Tuesday column and, you know, exercise is good for the brain, exercise is good for you. So maybe it's a completely indirect effect that enhances this plasticity and not, you know, and not the effect we're, we're thinking about. And fortunately for us, at around that time, um, Tom Sudoff's lab, Tom Sudoff at Stanford, had come up with uh, a wonderful molecular reagent that we could use to silence VIP cells. So tetanus toxin, you know, if you get tetanus, it's fatal because you don't breathe anymore because you can't release synaptic transmitter and make your muscles contract. But uh, he made a floxed tetanus toxin light chain, um, which you can uh, use to target to, to VIP neurons, among other things. He hadn't used it with VIP neurons, and silence their output. So they can't release neurotransmitter anymore. The cells look perfectly happy anatomically. They look normal, but they don't release neurotransmitter anymore. And the uh, effect of running on the responses, on average, is just abolished. The measuring the responses while they're stationary or running uh, shows no change. But the responses are normally selective for visual stimuli. These are just a few examples. So we silence the activity of the VIP neurons and did our assay of recovery while the animals saw visual stimu stimulate, stimuli during locomotion. And normally they recover pretty well. And if we block the output with tetanus toxin, the, the VIP, block the output of the VIP cells with tetanus toxin, they, they didn't recover so well. They recovered just like control animals, which I should have put in this graph. 
So this was consistent with the idea that we had before, that the VIP cells, that their activity putting the cortex in the high gain state really did enhance plasticity. And if we optogenetically activated the VIP cells, it turned out, in adults, if you, normally I said, you know, if you close one eye and it's outside the critical period, there's no effect. And that's indeed what we saw in the controls. But if we optogenetically activated the VIP cells during this period of time, we could get an effect of monocular visual deprivation. So blocking the VIP cells prevented plasticity, activating them let the cortex have a lot more plasticity. And I see I've been talking much slower than I should have, and I know I have to finish in the next seven minutes. So I'm going to go pretty fast. Um, fortunately, when we were doing these recovery experiments, we used two different visual stimuli. Uh, some of the animals saw a, a spatiotemporal band-limited noise stimulus like this matched to the spatiotemporal frequency response of the mouse visual system. Uh, and some of the animals instead saw a traditional visual neurophysiology stimulus, which is sine wave gratings moving at different uh, orientations with different spatial frequencies and so on. And it turned out that the recovery we saw in this assay was specific for the visual stimulus that we used. If we tested the animals with the noise pattern, the animals that had, had experience with the noise pattern during locomotion recovered beautifully. The animals that had had experience with the gratings, didn't, their response to the noise pattern didn't recover at all. It was just at control levels. And similar, in, you know, similarly, if we, the animals that had, had experience with the gratings, their response to the gratings improved tremendously. Their response uh, to the noise pattern didn't. So we wonder just how specific is this plasticity that's produced in the adult visual cortex by locomotion? Uh, and is it specific only when recovering from pathology, like the effect of monocular deprivation? So we looked at just, can, can you, does this form of plasticity really just enhance responses in normal intact animals measured with this completely non-invasive technique using the intrinsic signal imaging. And indeed, uh, we had three different stimuli in this experiment. Some of them saw vertical bars, some of them saw horizontal bars, some of them saw the noise pattern. And in each case, uh, and these were just normal animals, they saw it for an hour a day for five days, and then we measured again an hour a day for five more days, and then we let them sit in their cage for a week and measure them again. And what we saw is there is a stimulus-specific enhancement of response that's only for the stimulus that the animals had seen. And it depended on locomotion, because if we did exactly the same thing, but turned off or turned way down the air under the, the styrofoam ball, so they couldn't run anymore, and they, they gave up trying to walk, then, um, uh, there's really no enhancement, no significant enhancement, whereas this is the enhancement if they were allowed locomotion. So we were wondering, is this plasticity specific to individual cells? And so we did some more two-photon calcium imaging, and this is just a picture of what the calcium imaging looks like. You can see that the different cells twinkle at different times when they're activated by a visual stimulus. Uh, and, um, you know, this is just, these are the, the, the primary data for these experiments. So what we did in the next experiment was allowed some animals to see a gray screen during locomotion. Some animals saw 45 degree bars. Some animals saw 135 degree bars. And we looked at individual cells and, you know, if we measure the calcium responses of individual cells, these are the responses to bars moving in different directions before and then after five days of stimulation. Basically, if the animals were seeing a gray screen, there was basically no change. 
On the other hand, if you look at a cell that was selective for a 45 degree orientation, here's its responses before, and this is 45 degrees moving in one direction, moving in the other direction. This is the response. And then after four days, five days of an hour a day of stimulation with 45 degree lines during locomotion, the responses were very much greater. So there was, a, there was an enhancement that uh, was really quite dramatic. And if you took cells that originally responded to orientations near 45 degrees or 225 degrees, the, the two directions, their response was very dramatically enhanced by stimulation with 45 degree lines, whereas these cells were not enhanced by stimulation with 135 degree lines. And the opposite was true with cells that were originally selected for 135 degrees. But I actually like to look at a plot like this, and it's the same thing. If the original preferred orientation were near the orientation we stimulated with during locomotion, you see there's a dramatic enhancement of these cells, whereas these cells uh, were the cells whose initial preferred orientations were different, were much different from 45 degrees, weren't enhanced at all by, by the 45 degree stimulus. And the same thing with 135 degrees. And, and this is animals that saw a gray screen. You know, this, the fluctuation here shows like the noise and the measurement. So the conclusion is that there's this rapid and persistent increase in visual cortical responses. And, um, and even with a non-invasive method or with a slightly invasive method, the calcium imaging, what we see is a cell, a single cell specific uh, change in response. And what I'm not going to have time to do, because I know you guys have a class at 1215. Actually, I'll take three minutes and ask, what's special about the high gain state? Here you have an animal who he sees something repetitively and his responses for the cells, the, the enhancement is proportional to the original response to that stimulus. If it responds well to that stimulus, it'll be enhanced by 50%, and that enhancement will persist for weeks. Well, what's special about this state? And one question is, is there actually more information in the visual cortex about the world when the animal's in the high gain state? And so we can measure information by asking, if we record from 100 neurons simultaneously in the mouse's brain, can we tell which stimulus the animal is looking at? So your ability to predict with a, a support vector machine or linear discriminant analysis or, or one of the data analytic techniques, your ability to predict the visual stimulus on the basis of the response over a narrow period of time is a measure of how much information there is in the representation in the visual cortex. And so we measure the information, um, and uh, there's an increase in information in cells in all the layers of the visual cortex during locomotion. But of course, there are more spikes. So the interesting thing is, is there some change in the pattern of response in the cortex? And if you look at the distribution of responses while the animal's stationary, and the distribution of responses while the animal's walking or running, they're not completely separate. There's a region of overlap where you have the same number of spikes in the two cases, but in one case it's locomotion, in the other case is stationary. And so when we analyzed the information, and information increases down, what we see is even in cases with the same spike, same number of spikes, there's more information when the animal's walking or running than when he's stationary. So there's some change in the organized pattern of activity. So how do you make this a kind of real world thing? Well, you can measure, you know, the, the longer an animal looks at something, the more information there is in, in the spike trains that we record. So we can ask, suppose you get this amount of information when the animal's walking or running, how long does the animal have to look at it while he's stationary to get the same amount of information? And in 100 milliseconds of response during running, 
it takes between 300 and 500 milliseconds to get the same information about what's out there in the world when the animal's stationary. So I'll, I'll skip this. It, you know, we were trying to figure out what, which of the things that VIP cells release is responsible for this plasticity. And it turns out it's not the peptide. And we actually think, uh, can any of you guys read this? This is in Fraktur, in German Gothic letters. <laughs> this is what it is. So, you know, when I learned German, I could read German novels and stuff. But if I read an old German paper, which is printed in this font, I, it would take me forever. I'd have to go letter, le letter, letter, letter. This is perceptual learning. Uh, lets you learn these alphabets. Now, when I look at this, it just looks normal, as comprehensible as this. So, we're studying whether mice whether this system is the one that is responsible for perceptual learning in mice. And we don't know yet, so I'll, I'll leave it that. So I think this enhancement phenomenon is a really interesting thing. It's, it may be the basis of perceptual learning, and it's been a very satisfying thing to try to dissect this circuit in the mouse's brain, which is turned on, fortunately for us, it's turned on by locomotion. But this is in our brain too. And these VIP cells are exactly the ones that are receiving input from the frontal cortical areas that are involved in planning uh, what we're gonna do next. And so I think this very same circuit is, is likely to, you know, it was just lucky for us that locomotion activates it in mice, but other things activate it too. And, put the cortex in a state where it's set up to have more plasticity, uh, bigger responses and more plasticity than it happens uh, in, in couch potato mode. So uh, the one thing I want to do is show you a picture. Obviously, I could only tell one of the stories. Uh, show you a picture of the people in the lab who did this work. Um, and uh, uh, mostly they have their own laboratories now. Chris Neal is at Oregon, Yu Fu is at Singapore, who, who you did the work on the VIP cells. Chris did the work on uh, alert animals. Anyway, uh, Megumi Kaniko did the work on most of the plasticity experiments. Maria Dodderlot, who has her own lab at Purdue now, is, um, did the work on the representation of information and, and so on. Anyway, I've been blessed with wonderful people coming to my lab who've done great things. I don't exactly tell them what to do, but I try to make them understand that what I think is the most exciting and interesting thing to do, uh, to try to get them to think that too. And then, <laughs> then their, their industry and creativity is released, and they do things much better than what I would have done by myself. So. Thank you. So I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has some. I know a lot of you have to be at a class soon. Yes? So I, it makes perfect sense to me that, that as you're walking around and stuff, the visual cortex maybe has to be more attentive and more active. Yeah. But I'm still trying to wrap my head around Yeah, I, I mean, I am too, I mean, uh, basically. So, I mean, one of the things that we thought might be true, but turns out not to be true, is the faster you run, the faster the world passes you by, and maybe the accumulation of information would be more and more, but it's not true. It's binary. It's either locomotion or not. And so what I think is really going on is that, that locomotion is only one of the things that turns the VIP cells on. And I think, you know, focal attention or importance, things coming from the front of the brain back to the visual cortex also turn the VIP cells on. It's just that we don't know how to control those. Uh, and so 
we were just fortunate we could have a switch to kind of turn on and off that let us probe this circuit. But I think what this circuit is really doing is, is uh, activating the high gain state and the plasticity system in these other circumstances. So, but, you know, that's kind of hand, I mean, this, that's kind of bullshit at this point. <laughs> but but I, I do think it's very likely to be true. And I'm trying to persuade, you know, the technology that we use in mice is only available in the, the way we did it in mice, in, in mice, because of all these genetically altered lines. However, with viruses, you can now do this sort of thing in other animals. And David Fitzpatrick's lab in Florida has been doing it in ferrets. It's clearly going to happen in monkeys and so on. So we will be able to probe these systems in similar ways in brains that are much more like the human brain pretty soon. So it's, it, it's not in, it was inaccessible when we started doing these things. Uh, in fact, the whole world of genetically altered mice systems neuroscience, for the first five years of this, we could all meet in one room a quarter <laughs> the size of this. And we did. Every year we would meet at Cold Spring Harbor uh, in meetings that Alcino Silva organized. Uh, you know, and it was Eric Kendall and me and Stan McKnight, you know. There were like only f like five or six labs and we all exchanged mice and exchanged reagents and helped one another. Uh, and it seemed like it was, might never be the case that we we're going to be able to use it in, um, in ultimately in people and certainly in large animals. But that's, that's clearly not going to be true. The advances in the virus technology in the last couple of years have made it clear this is going to happen. Uh, so. It's a really interesting question, and I wish we, I, I mean, there are just four of us in the lab now. So I, I'm not sure that, I hope somebody looks at that, because I think it's a very interesting question, and I have no idea. We, we're doing, the only experiment we're doing, we're doing the plasticity, the enhancement, as a function of age. One of the slides I skipped over, because this is a big concern for me, is, what about aging? You know, do old mice have this uh, plasticity, capacity for plasticity that, you know, young vigorous mice have when they're 56 days old? And uh, it turns out old mice, if you do the same amount of experience, only have about half as much plasticity. But if you do it for twice as long, eventually they get to the same level of enhancement as, um, as young mice do. But unfortunately for old mice, it goes away much more rapidly, whereas in young mice, it lasts for weeks, as long as we've measured. So the stories, so anyhow, we haven't done the babies yet, critical period ones, and so we don't know. It's entirely possible that the babies are always in the high gain state, and you don't need locomotion, but uh, ask me in six months. <laughs> so, yes? Speak very loud. I don't hear very well. So the, uh, the uh, phenomena of the encounter recovery from the, like the eye. Yeah. Pathology, uh, has, you see that like, medical practice and um, That's an interesting story. So there's, there is a group in Italy which has case reports from a small number of, stu from a small number of patients that it works very well to enhance recovery from amblyopia. Uh, nobody's done a proper blind control study, so I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I have been, I have waited to, before doing that to try to get some indication from human electrophysiology whether the same thing is going on in human visual cortex. Because one of the things that's associated with this high gain state is a big increase in gamma oscillations that, you know, sort of 50 to 80 hertz 
uh, in the mouse brain. And so I've tried to measure gamma oscillations in people on a treadmill. And it's the gamma signal is small and there's a lot of artifact and we haven't succeeded in doing this. Because if one were gonna do a clinical trial, I think you would first wanna have evidence that this phenomenon actually exists in the human visual cortex. But anyhow, in Italy, uh, there are only positive reports, no negative reports. So I think it might work, but yeah. Uh, anyone else? No question. Yes. So it sounds like the high gain state during running is just magic. Is it ever bad for vision or bad for plasticity? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's puzzling because, you know, if you, if you look as what are the indications of familiarity with a visual stimulus? So um, Nicole Rust at Penn and Jim DiCarlo have done some, at MIT, have done some experiments with monkeys recording from the infratemporal visual cortex where cells are selective for complex objects and asking, you know, if you show them 50 things and then you show them some more, some of which were the same as the earlier ones, what happens always in their studies and other studies I know of is that the response to the object that they've seen before is less than, than it was. Whereas what we're seeing is an enhancement. And it may be a difference between mice and monkeys. It may be a difference between infratemporal cortex and V1. So I don't know, but I, I, we haven't we haven't seen anything that makes it worse. I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting. When people talked about cortical state, what they usually meant were different stages of sleep and then awake and anesthetized were the other two states. It's now clear there are at least two cortical states in mice that during alertness when they're capable of responding. And I don't know anything bad about the high gain state, but it, um, but we haven't measured anything that would let us, as, it's an interesting thought. Yeah? Just as an additional thought on the high gain state, it wouldn't really make sense in a prey animal for something that they would need for escaping predators to be detrimental to the instruments that would allow it to escape predators. So if they're stationary before they escape. But if it's just a matter of, if it's just a matter of motion and taking in information around the world, uh, it would make sense that it would be more commonly positive in a prey animal than it would be in a prey animal. Yeah. 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 It's too metabolically charged. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's um, a lot of the, you know, the mice, uh, there are these wonderful experiments that the first ones were done decades ago. But essentially, if you have a dark, a looming object, a dark spot that gets bigger or something, that's the most terrifying thing in the world to mice, up above, like an aerial predator, you know, but it can just be a dark spot that expands. And the mice will either freeze, or they'll, if there's a, a hidey hole for them, they'll run into their little hidey hole and, and not be eaten by the owl. And that, it turns out, is not done by the visual cortex. It's done in the midbrain. So there are built-in mechanisms for at least that kind of predator escape behavior that don't involve the cortex. Decor you know, you can take out the visual cortex. Mice will still do this. So whereas the kind of things we've been investigating all require the activity of the visual cortex. So, so it's functional arguments. I mean, I think a huge hole, and this is an area where engineering is going to make all the difference in the world, um, is we really, we really don't look at natural behavior. And what would be wonderful would be to record lots of neurons in the brain in unrestrained mice in a natural environment where they're running around and encountering things, and we could tell what they're looking at and so on. I, I think this is, this is going to be the future of neuroscience, but it, in, it, it takes a lot of new technology to figure out how to do this in, in a meaningful way. 
and um, you know we're just we're just not there yet. But I I think I think you know for me, I was really worried that the mice we were using, which for 200 generations have been raised in cages, these mice don't need to see. They people feed them right. They all they need to do is be able to smell enough to find the right place on the uh, opposite sex to mate. And that, that's, that's really, so I was really worried that we were looking at this totally vestigial degenerate visual system. And Chris Neal and, uh, and uh, Jen, his postdoc, did the most wonderful experiment after he went to his lab in Oregon. What they did is they made an enclosure uh, about a meter, meter and a half square that mice couldn't climb out of. They ordered mice from Jackson Lab, so they had a cage of five mice, and they got five crickets, little crickets like this, you know, threw them in the mouse cage the night before after the mice came from Jackson. The mice, they shared, I don't know, whatever they did, you know, they ate the crickets, they like eating crickets. The next day, you took one of these mice out that had been born in a cage from 200 generations of mice that had always been in cages. You put the mice down in the enclosure, you put a cricket there, and the mouse is like a guided missile. He loves crickets. He goes, he uh, navigates, he chases the cricket, and the cricket moves, the mouse goes, and, uh, and catches the cricket and, and eats it, of course. And so it's very clear even in these genetically altered mice that you know have been uh, outside the natural world for a long time, they still have visual predation. They're they're really good at this. So, uh, and that depends on visual cortex, not just on the midbrain. So, um, it made me a lot happier about working with our laboratory mice who who haven't lost all capacity for doing mouse-like things, but. But I think Siegfried Lüvel, who's a professor at Göttingen, who, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, she has done these experiments raising mice in, a, in a, an enriched environment, which is like uh, a three-level mouse condominium, two meters by two meters by two meters, with lots of floors, lots of hiding places, bunch of, lots of social activity. and where the technician hides the food in different places and changes the hiding place every couple of days. So this is much more like a natural world for the mice. And her mice have dramatically more plasticity than, than mice, normal cage-reared mice. And so if we could all afford it, I, I think, you know, because it's, it's very expensive. It takes up a lot of space and a lot of time. But the mice in these enriched environments um, have much more plasticity than the, than the, than the mice we see. So I, I think our mice might be like the Romanian orphans. You know, you, know this, you know, in Romania, where they prohibited birth control, and um, anyhow, there were, uh, when Romania fell apart, there were huge numbers of orphans and orphanages basically kept in cribs with no social stimulation. They were just given food. And their development was tremendously, there was a, a UN um, uh, delegation to sort of try to give therapy to, to these children. And they were dramatically impaired for the rest of their life by this very early social and sensory deprivation. Uh, Dick Held, the psychologist, was one of the people who went uh, in to see them. So, uh, so I think our cage-reared mice really are um, not showing all the capacity that mice in the natural world probably have. Of course, most mice in the natural world get eaten. But <laughs> so, so, yeah. All right. Anything else? Uh, we hope you enjoyed eating your lunch. Great. Okay. <laughs>